for that introduction. And I'm not blocking this anymore. We will have some more people along, but you know, they take a little time. You want to get started now, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, as he said, thank you. My name is Natasha Birch, and we are all here today to have a discussion about women's rights. I titled it Women's Rights Action Workshop because I'm hoping that we can all get from this the we'll discuss some facts, we'll discuss our, our ideas about women's rights, but hopefully we'll discuss ways we can take it and move towards action, towards equality and liberation for women. So, I hope I do this right. Okay. Uh, I have, I could talk for like two months about this subject, but I've only been given two hours, so I want to try to cover as much as I can. And to let you know the way we're going to be breaking down the lecture, in the beginning, I want to talk about the state of women in the world. Some statistics and some numbers, which will hopefully let us all realize that feminism and women's rights is still incredibly necessary and something that we still have to be working on. And then in the middle, uh, um, second section, just for a little bit, I want to talk about the origin of the modern women's rights movement in the U.S. I'll just take a few slides just to give us a background. And we are in the American Studies Center. So. The third part, we'll discuss the current, current women's rights movements throughout the Middle East. And each one of these topics could be a whole lecture in itself. So I hope you forgive me for the just skimming over the surface of some of these to try to enable us to get the bigger picture. And then we're going to end discussing what we can all do for women's rights. So I want to begin making sure we all have the same definition of what feminism is, the same working definition. The awareness that women are oppressed around the world in diverse ways and for diverse reasons. The belief that women should have equal economic, political, intellectual, sexual, and social rights as men. The belief that women and men should be equal and should be uh, are equal and should be treated as such in the law. So, if we're all clear on that, move on to the first part of the slide. I think we all probably know this fact: women make up 50% of the global population. Half of us, roughly, are women, and half of us are men. But women make up less than 15% of all government positions in the world. So. We make up 50% of populations, and yet we are vastly underrepresented in the governments. When performing equal labor, a woman earns 75 cents for every dollar that a man earns. So if you and I, we're both janitors, we're both doing the exact same job, just because you're a man and I'm a woman, I'm going to earn 25 cents less than you. Which, of course, leads to the feminization of poverty. If you see this sign, poverty has a woman's face. It is so true. Not only are we underrepresented in our government, so women have a hard time enacting laws that would change this, we make less money than men for doing the same job, which leads to 70% of all people in the world living in absolute poverty are women. 70% are women. 80% of the world's refugees are women and children. Women work two-thirds of all the world's labor hours, but only earn 10% of all the world's wages. So really let that hit you for a second. We make up 50% of the world's population, less than 15% of the world's government. We're 70% of all people living in absolute poverty. Yet we work most of the labor hours. And additionally, we produce 70% of the world's food. So 70% of the food that we eat every single day is produced, packaged, grown by women. And yet, if you'll see the next statistic, we own less than 2% of all farmland. Additionally, women receive less than 1% of all loans and bank assistance given to farmers. Even though most farmers are women, we get vastly less assistance than is given to men. Uh, in the world of education, two-thirds of illiterate adults are women. Two-thirds of illiterate adults are women. And this isn't because women are naturally inclined to be illiterate. It's because when you're a poor family and you can only afford to send one of your children to school, you are going, in general, to, to send your, your son instead of your daughter. 
and daughters are always the first one pulled out of school to allow the boys to continue their education. So two-thirds of illiterate adults are women, and 70 million girls do not receive any schooling at all. Do you guys see the cumulative, cumulative effect of all these statistics? We're half the population, hardly any of the government. We do most of the work, but are paid nothing, and on average, we are very uneducated. So the problem just gets compounded and compounded and compounded. It's a vicious cycle. All of this, the illiteracy and the uneducation of girls, is especially painful because the number one proven way to lower a woman's birth rate and increase the chances of health for her children and their future success and education is first of all through a mother's literacy rate and for paychecks for the women. It's been shown that when a woman receives one dollar, she spends more of it on her family than on herself and a man will spend a greater percentage on himself than improving his family. One out of three of us women will be raped or sexually assaulted in our lifetime. This is a global statistic. One out of three of us will be raped in our lifetime. Just to give you some idea, um, in the US, which is supposedly so free and so brave, out of convicted rapists, men that are actually found guilty of the crime of rape, less than 50% of them more than 50% of them spend less than 11 months in jail for their crime. And men that are found guilty of rape spend less than 11 months in jail for their crime. 35% of women experience domestic violence in their lifetime. And of course, out of these two things, not only if you accuse a man of rape will you most likely be blamed or shamed or insulted for it, you also know that he's probably not going to spend much time in jail. So it creates a culture of silence. When this has happened to us women, and we're victims of this, we end up feeling guilty and ashamed. And the men end up very rarely being punished for it sufficiently. More violence against women is female genital mutilation. 140 million women in the world are victims of FGM, and there's 3 million new cases every year. FGM, the definition is the total or subtotal amputation or mutilation of the female genitalia. This occurs throughout many countries in Africa and countries in the Middle East. And it is an absolute epidemic, one of the most violent expressions of sexism and the oppression of women. It occurs usually between the ages of 5 and 10 on little girls that are too young, of course, to give their consent to this kind of procedure. It's done not usually in hospitals, it's done um, in unsanitary conditions with unsanitary non-surgical tools. <coughs> Rusty pieces of metal, sharp glass, and the reason that people do this to their daughters is because it's supposed to ensure their purity. It's, in, it's supposed to ensure that they don't have sex before marriage, that they don't cheat on their husbands. But first of all, it's unnecessary and dangerous and it doesn't work. What it leads to of course, other than depression and feeling of shame and, and hatred for your own natural body. It leads to infection, death, hemorrhage, shock. Uh, it threatens future pregnancies and the future health of your children, and it can also lead to sterility. So those were the statistics. A uh, very grim way to start our lecture, but I wanted to make sure we all understood the state of women in the world. Women have not achieved equality with men in any country. This inequality has long-reaching, catastrophic effects on society. Like I said before, a vicious cycle. Sexism and violence against women is everywhere. Now, these statistics, while they are very, very powerful and very true realities for many women in the world, it might not affect you and me completely. We might see these numbers and say, oh, that's so sad, but what's the relevance in my life? So I want us to all just take a moment as, as women and think of how many times we have experienced sexism. Where I know it happens to me daily, weekly, monthly, in, in Bahrain, in Saudi, in Europe, and in America, in every country that I've ever been to. It happens in a different way or in a different form. So let's all just remember that and understand how much it really does affect our daily life. 